This is taking your foster program to the next level. If you're in the wrong place, hit the door now. Otherwise, I'm Scarlett and I'll be your host today. A little bit about me. I spent 10 years with the Nevada Humane Society in a variety of foster program related roles. I'm currently a graduate student at UC Davis. I'm in my final year in the Community and Regional Development Program. I'm also the chair of the UC Davis Animal Studies Research Group. Um, I also work for Maddie's Fund. I'm building a foster management certification program for them. A little bit about my research interests. Um, I'm interested in the role of shelters as community institutions. I'm interested in diversity and representation in the shelter workforce. I care a lot about class and race-based inequalities in relation to pet ownership. And I'm doing a lot of work right now on contemporary issues in urban animal management for municipalities. So if any of that interests you, come find me. Um, so a couple of ground rules for this presentation. I know a fair amount about fostering in Nevada at the Nevada Humane Society. That's probably not super pertinent to a lot of people in this room. So I'm gonna try to run this lecture less like a lecture and more like a discussion. Each one of us in this room is an expert in our own area at our own institution. Every one of you has a brilliant idea that will revolutionize fostering. And every one of you in this room has a solution to somebody else's challenge. So my job here today is to act as a facilitator. I'm gonna share a couple of ideas I've seen be successful in the field with you, but for the most part, I'm here to help us all learn from each other's inherent knowledge. Um, so let me get a feel for who's in the room. Can I see a show of hands for my foster program managers? Okay, okay. Um, other shelter staff that work with foster programs? Ah, there you guys are, all right. Directors? Thank you, directors, hello. Volunteers, yay, love our volunteers. Uh, foster caregivers, woohoo, I love you guys, all right. Veterinary staff, nice, thank you for coming out. Anybody else I forgot? Is that pretty much everybody? Okay, so let me see a show of hands if you're sitting next to somebody from your home organization. Great, I'm gonna need all of you guys to split up. Because the way this is gonna work is that you're gonna share ideas with new groups of people as opposed to sitting around with the people you work with every day talking about the same thing. So one of you two, stand up and then just go find another chair. And while these guys are integrating, I want you guys to take a minute to turn to the people around you, ideally group up into pods of three or four and just introduce yourselves. Take a couple of minutes to talk to each other. All right, did we do introductions? Do we feel thoroughly potted? Everybody has a firm understanding of who's around them? Okay, so we're gonna move on. So you're gonna use your pods in the upcoming exercise and I'll explain it in a second. But first I wanna define what does taking it to the next level mean? So they said, you know, can you give a lecture on foster care? And I said, sure, we'll talk about data, we'll talk about processes, we'll talk about recruitment. And then I had to stop myself and say, you know what, this is actually advanced foster management. I bet every single person in this room is already keeping data. I bet you guys already have processes for getting animals in and out of your shelter. I bet you already are doing the basics of recruitment. You know how to put an ad on Facebook. You know how to send a blurb out to your community saying, we need more fosters. So I had to say to myself, well, what does taking it to the next level mean? And what can I actually teach them about that? So that said, if you read the description um, and you're sitting here going, but wait a minute, I really needed help with data, come find me. We'll talk about it outside of the presentation. We'll exchange cards, we'll troubleshoot. So if I don't go over something today that I said I would in the description and you're like, that was really important to me, I'm around, yeah? Okay, so taking it to the next level, the traditional foster model, generally word of mouth recruitment amongst your staff and your existing volunteers, you probably have a limited budget for advertising. Um, are you frantically trying to place fosters in homes all the time? Are you constantly calling foster families? Does this sound pertinent to most people? I can't, like, please take a foster. So that's the traditional model. So for me, taking it to the next level means really being willing to examine this model and say, what else can we do to solve our fostering challenges? And keep that in mind as we go through the presentation today. What else can we do outside of the traditional model? So we're gonna go over three basic challenges today. Recruitment, retention, and support. Challenge one, never have enough foster homes, constantly having to recruit. So for me, this is one solution. 
The next level when it comes to recruiting foster homes for me is less about reaching more individual homes and reaching out to community partners, saying who in my community can actually help me get more fosters with more humans. Um, I've seen this work really successfully with retirement homes and it's great PR, prison programs. The Nevada Humane Society is running a kitten foster program out of a women's correctional facility. Um, managed intake. This is probably going to sound really basic, but it blew my mind when I heard of it. Asking people dropping animals off, would you be willing to foster this pet? You found a litter of kittens? Great. Would you be willing to foster? And if they say, ah, I don't know, say, okay, I don't have a foster right now. Can you bring it back to me tomorrow? Can you bring it back in 48 hours? Give me two days to find a foster. That's your short-term foster placements. And other things that work really well with short-term foster placements, I just heard about this and I thought it was great, Austin Pets Alive, of course, is doing uh, lunch break fosters. So you can check out a dog for lunch, take it with you, bring it back. And a lot of you are probably saying, you know, that kind of sounds like a waste of time, right? But what it does is it gives that animal an advocate. If you let somebody take an animal for the afternoon, they're going to say, I'm not ready for a dog right now, but I'm going to find this dog a home, right? Um, additional ideas, teens, schools, youth groups. So I have realized most people don't want to stand up and share their opinion in a room this size. So the reason I have potted you is you are going to talk about this question. What is your next level solution to recruiting more foster families in your pod? You guys are going to decide on one answer for your pod. Ooh, that got really loud. I'm sorry. So I'm going to give you guys five minutes, turn to your pod, discuss the question of our next level solution for recruiting more foster families. When you come up with an answer, Text it. Yeah? I'm seeing some confusion. <laughs> Wave me down if you're like, I don't understand what we're doing, and I'll jog over there. OK, so let's bring it back, you guys, so we can chat about these things really quickly. This was kind of our, our demo exercise. You can keep sending answers in. All right, so what do we have? Unique event opportunities, adult birthday parties, weekend giveaways, I like this. Is this more deciding, like, if we can get them in the door, maybe we can recruit them to foster? Is that, okay, I like that. Um, you know, a story I like to tell, I used to work for Dyson, I used to sell vacuums, and um, Dyson was fine if I didn't sell a single vacuum, right? Because I was building a rapport with the people who were coming in the door. And I'd say, hi, have you heard about Dyson? And they'd go, I'm not ready to buy a vacuum. And I'd say, that's cool. I'm here if you have any questions. And some weeks I'd see the same people and they'd side eye me, I'm like, you just want to sell me. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to sell you, but you know, do you have a pet? Do you want to talk about your dog? Yeah, I got a lab. Oh, it must be hard to clean up. You know, and we chat, and we chat, and we chat. <laughs> um, and I do this constantly, right? And Dyson was cool, they were cool. Black Friday rolls around, I sell fifty thousand dollars worth of Dysons in one day. Blew the store's mind because all of those seeds that I had planted came back to roost. So this is a great idea. If we get them in the door, we can talk to them about fostering. Maybe they're not ready, but we're on their radar. So I love this idea. Mentoring program with experienced fosters. We're going to talk about that. Steal my thunder. Providing resources for foster animals. New retirees. I like new retirees. They've got time. They like quick, cuddly things. Rehab facilities. Great. Animals are really important to recovery. We have a lot of research supporting this. Facebook groups, yes. Social media, yes. Newsletters, reach out to your community. Tell them what you're doing, ask for their support. Wonderful. Okay, so challenge two, retention. So when it comes to retention, we have to keep in mind that some level of attrition is just a fact of life. You're gonna have fosters that are gonna burn out and you're always gonna be recruiting. But how many of us feel like we get fosters who come in and they're really excited and they do one litter or one foster animal and then they're gone? Is this? Yeah, so that speaks to the importance of retention, right? Um, so we need to keep the focus on the foster families we have. If they're good foster families, let's do what we can to keep them. So a couple of challenges to retention. Do you have barriers and obstacles in your institution? We are gonna talk about these. Is there a lack of community and engagement? Is there a lack of support? So, as with adoptions, this is a big discussion in adoptions right now, right? Do you have a laborious application process where people are like, I'm not going to adopt from them because it's too much work? Same thing with fosters. Do you have a ridiculous foster application or process? Are you selecting them out before they even get a chance because you're handing them a 50-page application and they're like, oh, this is really intense? Things to think about. 
Um, what is the process like for your fosters to actually participate with you? Is it really difficult for them to get regular and emergency medical care? Are they bending over backwards? Does nobody answer their calls? What can you do to make those processes easier for them? Remember, this should be fun, right? Fosters should like to foster, not feel like, oh man, this is just such a challenge and I had a kitten die because nobody called me back. We don't want that, right? And then working with foster families and meeting them where they are. We already talked about the importance of short-term fosters. If somebody says, you know, I can only foster this for a week, you know, if it works for you, take it. Um, keep animals in those homes. If somebody says, well, I'd love to foster, but I don't drive or I can't come to your shelter, would you be willing to drive them a litter of kittens? You willing to meet those fosters where they're at if they're willing to work with you? Um, other retention ideas, building community. So we have to think about what a fosters want, what a fosters need, right? So they, they want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel like they're helping. They want to feel valuable. They want to feel needed and important. But that's kind of difficult for them because they're not a traditional volunteer. They're not in the organization working directly with you, seeing you every day. They're kind of separated and it's easy to forget about them. Um, so some ways that we can build community within the shelter and within our fosters. Set up foster Facebook groups and other chat mechanisms. This is really great for a variety of reasons because it allows fosters to ask basic behavior and medical questions to each other, taking some of the strain for answering all those questions off of you, right? And you're probably saying, well, what if they're giving bad information? Well, have somebody monitor the page. If you see something that's outrageously wrong, you know, step in. But otherwise, let fosters chat with each other. Um, they can ask, use this to address challenges with each other, to get emotional support, to build school or skills. It makes them feel more connected to each other and to your organization's mission, which is going to reduce dropout. Um, and it's really great for providing feedback to you guys about where you might need more training. If you see the same question popping up on the Facebook group over and over and over again, even if you covered it in training, it's likely that your fosters aren't getting the message if they're still asking the same questions. Right? So it's a good feedback tool for you. Other ways we can build, um, build community and, and retention. We talked about this a little bit in the last presentation. Um, trust your experienced fosters with more responsibility if they're willing to take it on. Set up mentorship and support groups um, led by experienced fosters, right? Give out the experienced fosters number. Say, hey, this is somebody who's done this for a long time to new fosters, so you know they're willing to talk to you. Um, invite them to participate in trainings and recruitment, ask them to write for your newsletter. Anything that makes them feel like you care about their input is going to help with retention. And don't be afraid to give them more responsibility for basic medical and emergency care. When my organization started letting me do my own sub-Q fluids instead of making me drive all the way to the shelter every time I had a dehydrated kitten, it made a big difference. Not only because I felt like they trusted me, but because it made the process easier for me as a foster. Yeah? All right. So we're back to this. So the next challenge, turn to your pod. What is your next level solution for retaining foster families? What do you guys do? Okay, so this is what I wanted to see. These responses are phenomenal, you guys. I am loving the thinking caps. Let's talk about these. Work with other shelters. Oh, they're still coming, all right. Allow them to be part of the adoption process. I've seen this one twice. This is a great answer, right? Because fosters care about their fosters. And I, I mean, have any of us experienced, like you get a foster, you put all this work into it, and you give it back to the ether? It's just gone into the void and you just have to hope? That's kind of hard. Let them be a part of the adoption process, even if it's just adding cute pictures or writing a bio for their pet. It makes them feel more engaged, like they're really important to this process. Utilize animal control or volunteers to deliver supplies? Yes, why not? Say, what part of the city do you live in? Would you, you know, drop off a case of cat food to Candy? She's 90 years old and has 16 kittens. You know, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I would do that as a volunteer. Um, work with other shelters. I, I like this, but can, can somebody talk to me about how this uh, works towards retention? Any? Uh, Okay, so working with the volunteers and the foster families and surrounding organizations, that is wonderful. Providing support through Facebook or Google groups, free training for dogs, free kitten training, on-call phone, yes, all of these things, yes. Even if fosters never utilize these resources, just knowing they're there can really make them feel better about the process. Having an annual party, I'm always down for parties. Make it a potluck, it'll save you money. 
again, people like to cook and feed others, especially if you're using retirees. Um, an appreciation picnic at the end of the year, kitten season? Yes, this is great. Make sure a mentor is accessible at all times, keeping open the lines of communication with fosters? Yes, yes. Some of these are gonna go into my next points with support. Um, convenience and what they need, absolutely. Convenience and getting them supplies, that's part of that barriers and obstacles process, right? They shouldn't have a hard time getting what they need for their foster. Um, including them in the newsletter, yes! I know, I know Nevada Humane for a long time. They had like a volunteer appreciation wall where they'd put the dog walkers and they'd have a party and they'd feature them in the newsletters. And all of us fosters who were home with like kitten poop up to our ceiling fans are like, hey, what the heck? They just walked a dog. Do you know what I did? I have ringworm. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yes. So even if your fosters aren't present in the shelter, make sure they're part of that appreciation process and that you're saying, yes, I recognize that you exist. What else do we have? 24-hour volunteer vet care, yeah. Have somebody dedicated to follow-ups, yeah. Yeah, why not? Um, checking in on them, and again, we'll get to some of these things. Seasonal fosters, can somebody explain seasonal fosters to me? Yeah. Nice, you know, and that probably works really well because then you're not hammering them during the summer and they don't feel guilty for saying no. I like this, see, we're getting into the psychology of fosters. Yeah, that is next level. Um, Facebook group, barbecue, informal get together, sure. I mean, they might be busy. Fosters might not be in the shelter volunteers for a variety of reasons. Um, I know when I started fostering, I did it because I had anxiety and I wanted to feel connected to something, but you know, I was just having a hard time leaving the house. So getting them out of the house, they might not come, but saying like, hey, come be with other people who are like you, you know, that's hard, right? Am I the only adult who struggles to make friends as a grown up? <laughs> so, yeah, see, make friends with kitten people. We can all talk and then they have something to talk about. It's social lubricant because you can just share pictures and stories. This is brilliant. Allowing them to be part of the adoption process. You guys are on this. I wish we could do this all day long. I'm loving these. All right, let's talk about support. Um, and one more thing I want to throw in about, about uh, foster retention. Really appreciate them. I, I would hope I wouldn't have to say this, right? But really, I mean, go overboard. You might be like, oh my God, this is cheesy. But appreciate the heck out of them. Just say thank you constantly. Tell other people, brag about your fosters, right? Make them feel like they are really needed and they are really integral to your organization because they are, yeah? All right, supporting our foster families. Now I know, I know there's some of you who are sitting there like, these are all good ideas, but I'm overworked. I've already got 60 hours on the clock. I don't have any money. I don't have any time. I don't have any staff. You're sitting here telling me to do more programming. Anybody like quietly thinking that in their head? Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate those really honest hands. Um, I totally understand foster programs are a lot of hand holding and a lot of work. I get that. I get that we're all overworked. One of the things that's important about next level foster management though is not only does it further your mission, it makes less work for you later on. You're gonna put some work into it up front, but the payback, if it's done right, is that it reduces your overall workload, right? So retention reduces our workload with recruitment. Support reduces our <laughs> workload with retention. And we're gonna get into that. So like the Foster Facebook group, you're gonna have to set up a Facebook group. It's gonna take you 10 minutes, but if you get it going and your fosters are answering each other's questions, those are calls you don't have to field all day long, right? If it keeps them from dropping out, that's new families you don't have to recruit. So weigh, you know, weigh the payoff. So supporting our foster families. Again, I really hope I don't have to say this, but really ask yourself critically, are we doing this? Are you asking them, how is it to foster? Are you listening to their concerns and are you following up? I think I was with my organization for five or six years before we even thought to do a foster survey. Ask your fosters, how's it going? What could we do better? Is this working for you? Where are the snafus? Because they're there somewhere. Um, make sure your foster hotline and your foster staff, anybody who has contact with these people, no judgment. I don't care if you have to take the call and put it on mute and roll your eyes at everybody in the office. Oh my God. <laughs> if you unmute that phone though and you pick it up, 
Hi, Barbara. Yeah, I know diarrhea is really concerning, and I know that it's happened the last 10 times you've had kittens, but let's talk about how to give pumpkin again, right? <laughs> every time, every time, and every person who interacts with the public, hi, Barbara, thanks for being a foster. What are your concerns? <laughs> we really value your commitment to the organization, Barbara, right? But never to the fosters. And you may be saying, we're not judgmental. Ask, listen, follow up, right? Maybe if you had some of those families that dropped out, send them a survey. Hey, we haven't seen you in a while. No pressure, but can you tell us why you stopped fostering? You might get some surprising results. Clear communication. People need to be given information in a variety of ways to learn it. Um, one of the ways that I tackle this is having a basic sheet of talking points in relation to common foster groups. So ferals, bottle babies, um, URIs, and I'm gonna show you an example in a minute. You have the talking points. When they show up to get the foster, a staff member goes through the talking points with them, and then you send them home. So when they go, I have no idea what they said to me. I just wanted to leave with my kittens. And they're like, how do I give the medication? It's on the sheet, right? They can see it. They can hear it. They can read it. Um, so I'm sorry this is a little small. This is what one looks like for my ferals. What is a feral kitten? What is the critical socialization period? Um, how do you handle? How do you socialize them, right? basic information that every person who goes home with an unsocialized kitten is gonna get. On the back of this sheet is the same information for every single foster. Keep your fosters away from your pets. Don't use clumping cat litter, right? Don't use carpet. Don't use an expensive carpet and then call and ask me if I'll pay for it. Um, <laughs> and then at the bottom, I've got phone numbers, right? Because I did this for years and I would still go, oh my gosh, somebody's crashing. What is that phone number? It's at the bottom of the talking points. They have something to refer to, every single foster. And I have copies of all of these if this is something where you're like, I'd like a template for this. Come find me, come get a card, I'll email it to you. Um, use outside resources. Do we know that Maddie's Fund has resources for foster care? Yep, because I work for Maddie's Fund, so I'm gonna plug our stuff. Um, so this is, a, this is a screenshot off our website for the flash classes. Maddie's has short two to 10 minute videos about how to do basic care for animals. Emergency care in kittens, socializing, taking a temperature. These are things you can refer your fosters to. Hey, here's some talking points, we went through it. Call me if you have any questions. There's also a URL in there for a video if you'd like to watch a video on how to socialize your kitten. This is a trusted partner of ours, they really like this video. So they can hear it, they can see it, they can watch it. Variety of methods for teaching information. Also, how many of us know about the Maddie's, Maddie's Pet Assistant app? What? <laughs> Prepare to be amazed, my friends. What happens to the pets in your program after they're adopted or go into a foster home? In a perfect world, you'd have time to follow up on every pet after they leave your program. But in the real world, time is hard to find. Well, guess what? There's a way you can find out what happens to your pets after they move into homes, and you don't have to do a thing to start the conversation. There's an app for that. It's Maddie's Pet Assistant, a mobile app for adopters and foster caregivers that the cats and dogs at Maddie's Fund demanded we create to make sure that their cousins and caregivers across the country could stay in touch with you. And being the tech savvy pets that they are, they also insisted that the app be usable on both Apple and Android phones and tablets. So we made it happen. Here's how the app works. When a pet's adopted or goes into foster care, you change their status in your shelter software, right? Then your new assistant, Maddie's Pet Assistant, takes over. Your organization's adoption and foster care data automatically downloads to Maddie's Pet Assistant twice a day so you don't have to manually enter anything. Then your trusty new assistant sends an email with login information directly to the caregivers. So how do caregivers use the app to share info with you? The app sends surveys to adopters and foster caregivers, focusing on the first month with questions about their pet's health and behavior. This helps them know if what they're experiencing is normal or if they should get help. And besides answering survey questions, they can also track weight and vaccinations and submit questions, comments, photos, or videos, capturing lots of adorable pictures and testimonials for your group to use. Here's the wonderful part. When a caregiver submits a survey, they instantly receive a response within the app and also in an email with helpful tips and links to address their concerns. Yes, instant advice. 
they no longer have to wait for a return phone call or email. Your organization's help is on the way, but we've got you covered in the meantime. You're probably wondering what kind of advice an app could possibly give. Don't worry, it's expert advice crafted by shelter medicine veterinarians and veterinary behaviorists. The app doesn't diagnose, treat, prescribe, or replace veterinary care. What the app does is provide helpful tips and links to related information. And the app is smart. If a highly concerning answer is submitted, it advises adopters to contact their veterinarian and foster caregivers to contact their foster coordinator ASAP. So here's where you come in. You get to see everything caregivers submit in the app by gazing deeply into your crystal ball. Or, if you don't have one of those, by logging into your Maddie's Pet Assistant website. You'll need to set up a schedule for staff or volunteers to log into the website every day to review surveys and follow up with caregivers who need additional help. We set it up so surveys and answers are color-coded so you know which ones you need to follow up on first. Pretty awesome, right? So, when a foster caregiver says that George Washington, that adorable little chihuahua who hid in his kennel at the shelter, is now running away from everyone who tries to touch him, you'll see a yellow flag next to that answer. That's your cue to pick up the phone to follow up. But that's not all. On the website, you can also edit pet profiles, send emails to app users, and for all you data nerds out there, you can run reports to your heart's content. So to review, the app helps caregivers with instant advice and lets them know if what they're experiencing is normal. It also gives them an easy way to ask questions, share pictures, and more. The app helps you receive information about how your pets are doing after they go home without having to dedicate staff time to ask. It helps you prioritize your follow-up so you help those who need it the most first. It allows you to stay in touch with adopters and foster caregivers long-term. And most importantly, it helps more pets stay in their homes by providing advice at the time it's needed. Well, that's it. That's Maddie's Pet Assistant in a nutshell. If you still have questions, go to maddiesfund.org slash MPA to learn more. And if you're ready to sign up now, you can do that on the same webpage. Just click on the Register Now button to get started. All right, I saw a lot of furrowed brows out there. If you're looking at me like, no way is it going to work for our organization, try a pilot program. Grab 10 fosters and say, hey, will you try this app out and see if it works? Okay, questions on the, the Maddie's Pet Assistant app. You can use it with Animal Shelter Manager, Pet Point, and Shelter Love. Shelter Love is brand new, and it does a lot more than those other software programs, so check it out, shelterloveluv.org. Um, also, you can manually enter the data into the website if that's an option you want. Say you're doing a pilot program, you can. All right, so this is our last round of questioning. We've got 10 minutes left. I think you know the drill by now. Take five minutes, turn to your pod, discuss how you support foster families. What is your next level idea for supporting fosters? Text them in, we'll chat about it, and then we'll answer some questions if we have time. So we're gonna go through these really quick because I've got a burning question that I wanna get back to. Regular check-ins to catch molehills before the, yes, before their mountains, and they never feel alone. Sure, and I mean, you, you could, if you're like, I do not have enough staff or energy to do regular check-ins, send a text message, send an email. Um, you can do automated large-scale texts. You can text, you know, everybody who's got a foster. Hey, this is Sarah from humanesocietyofcity.org. Just checking in with you and your fosters. Let us know if you have any questions. Check out the Facebook group. Enabling them to have an impactful voice in the program, which hopefully turns into a fostering community. Yes, I love this. Get their feedback. You know, don't be afraid if your organization supports it to let them be partial architects in their experience. Sharing the burden of answering calls. Facebook or another messenger app. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's brilliant. See, this is why we're crowdsourcing the knowledge, guys. Look how good at this you are. Um, make sure we're using every tool in our toolbox. Facebook, app, messenger, newsletter, emails, phone calls. Yeah, just letting them know that you're there so they don't feel like you sent them home with a litter of kittens and now what? Because a lot of them will go home and I go, I have a litter of kittens, now what? Um, 
Find out their interests and give them incentives based on their interests. Yes, we can also use an interest profile to target those appreciation events, right? Maybe do a movie night or a pizza night or a field trip. You can let them organize field trips. Does somebody want to go on a field trip to the zoo? Get them, you know, t-shirts and little hats or something. They can be walking billboards. Um, have experienced foster mentors answer questions? Yes, because what does that do? That takes the burden off of you, that gets information out there, and it makes your experienced fosters feel engaged because you're trusting them to do that job, right? Next level thinking. Constant communication, especially with first time foster families. Yes, because ideally, right, if we get them over the first couple times of a hump, they'll get a little more independent, ideally. Barbara, not so much, but like we talked about with volunteers, some people are doing this for the social aspect, so they might be calling you for the social aspect. And that's where that community, letting them build community with each other thing, really comes in handy. These are really brilliant ideas, you guys. Um, so I want to get back to this question. What do we do with staff that are resistant to fostering? One, find out why. Not just, I don't like this. What are your specific concerns? What are you afraid is going to happen? And then what can we, you know, and it helps too if you know what kind of person that is, right? I'm very analytical, I'm very data driven. If you give me data, if you show me that it's worked somewhere else, all right, maybe I'm not on board, but you know, you got data. Are they a data person? Do they need to be more involved with the process? Maybe they need to like check on the fosters and make sure nobody's like eating them. I don't know what their concern is. Um, Additionally, and this is going to sound really harsh, I'm extremely interested in the process of what takes an organization from kill to no kill. And I feel like the number one thing I hear from every single manager who's done this transition is you've got to get rid of the doubters. If people aren't on the train, they're going to hold you back. If they're still swimming in the euthanasia pool, they will pull you down and drown you. So I'm not saying fire every person who's not on board with your foster program. You probably don't have the authority to do that. But keep in mind that sometimes there are people who have a very different idea of what it takes to save lives. Um, and you might not be able to overcome that. In the same respect though, don't be afraid to say, hey, if this is a concern, talk to me, not to the foster. They don't have anything to do with this. You know, all they're trying to do is help. So don't make them feel bad because you know, we're, you're concerned. Keep it here, yeah? All right, so it is officially lunchtime. If you have more questions, I'm here, come chat with me. Um, if you want resources or templates, bring me a card. Thank you.